Well, good morning. Uh, that was a little loud. <laughs> I have to say, when I got the uh, request to speak here, I was very excited. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things about the group, and I do wish it had been around when I was in the Air Force. Um, but then I saw my name was against the time slot for Saturday morning, and uh, I have to admit, I hesitated a little bit. Uh, but I remember most of you in the audience are still active duty, and uh, you know, I just told myself I had to suck it up. So, um, so for this morning's talk, uh, I want to bring some perspective uh, from the Silicon Valley on the military's uh, outreach into the region, and uh, talk about my experiences. I'm going to draw my, from my experiences from my company, uh, BMT Partners. We, we've been there for two years now. Uh, we provide a platform to bring military problems and national security issues uh, into the Valley to try to bridge some of those partnerships and help solve those problems. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of our experiences with that, what we've seen to be successful, and then what I see as some of the pathways forward. So a lot of the questions that I get about the Silicon Valley is why, why there, and why should the government care about this one region uh, when there's a lot of great tech that's being produced across the U.S. and other innovation centers. And um, I agree with that. That's, that's true. Um, but if you look at it from a, just a numbers perspective, right, uh, half of the venture capital funding that's being spent today is coming out of the Silicon Valley, uh, which is about roughly $4 billion a year. And, and that's the money that's being used to, to spur new innovation, uh, new technologies, new companies that really are having global impacts. And then if you take that a step further and look at just the R&D money that's coming out of the Silicon Valley, so just look at the top three companies, Google, Facebook, and Apple, right? Their R&D budgets are roughly about $20 billion a year. Um, and then you look at what that innovation is pr producing in terms of the innovation cycles of how, what that money is, being, is producing in terms of how long it takes to get a new product into the hands of consumers. That's roughly about 24 months, give or take, a couple, couple months. Um, so about every year and a half to two years, you get a new product that's integrated in the hands of consumers ready for use. And then you compare that back to the DOD budgets. And you look at what the DOD is spending in terms of R&D. And so that's roughly about $70 billion a year. And that, those budgets have been shrinking for the past five years. And, and if you look at where that R&D money is going in terms of what it's being spent on, there is overlap in terms of what's being spent out of the Silicon Valley or out of venture money and R&D money in terms of what the DOD is spending that on. Um, if you take that across the U.S. and you look at, well, how much R&D is being spent commercially, right, that comes out to about $150 billion a year. And so it's almost double what, what the DOD is spending right now in R&D. And again, there's certainly overlap in technology areas. If you look at cyber, cybersecurity, energy, healthcare, uh, data analytics, robotics. And so you have to wonder, well, how much out of that R&D budget from the DOD is being spent on technology that already exists in the commercial space, or it's in a lab somewhere that you know, we just don't know about, or it's in some company's lab, or it's, it's being developed, and, and the, the DoD just doesn't know because we don't have access or good access into what the private sector is doing. And so just if you look at it from that perspective, that's when I think it really starts to make sense in terms of why the DoD should start looking at the private sector and, and, and trying to make better relationships because not only will it save the DOD money and not having to spend that money on commercial or tech that's already developed, but we'll also be able to get into the hands of the people that are using it much quicker. So next slide, or sorry, <laughs> I've got the, the thing. Okay, so, so what do we do to, uh, how do we bridge this gap in terms of overcoming the hurdles that it takes to work with the government. Um, everybody in the room is probably aware of how challenging it is to do business with the government and the bureaucracy that's in place, and, and all of that's true. Uh, what we found, and, and I think 
the way that we, the way that we approach it at my company is we look at it from just the first steps that the government takes in building some of those those relationships. And so, how does the government today uh, engage private industry? Well, typically, what happens from an acquisitions perspective is when a program manager is looking at um, a, a technology or a, pr a program that they want to do, typically the first thing that they'll do is they'll put a request for information out onto FedBizOps or an RFI. And that is meant to serve as their market research. It's meant to serve as a method to basically you know, get feedback from industry in terms of what it is that they're buying and provide them with a roadmap to help them better inform you know, their program and their program plan and their budget and all of that. Um, another method is the government will hold um, industry days, right? So you, you hold a meeting and, and you put PowerPoint slides up in terms of what your, what, your, you know, what your plans are for this technology and then you invite industry to come in and provide feedback. And so if you look at those two methods of engagement, just from the start, Right? And, and, and I'm drawing from my experience from when I was in government acquisitions and, and I'd use these methods of engagement. Right? Most of the people that are going to show up to that is going to be traditional defense companies because they're the ones that are looking at FedBizOps. Right? They're the ones that understand how to read an RFI and what all the language means and the acronyms and you know, what the budget cycles in the government are. And, and, and they just understand that better and they're primed to respond to that much better. Um, if you show those same things, or you know, if you show an RFI back to a commercial company who's never worked with the government, right? They look at that and it, they get they get hives, right? <laughs> Trying to respond to it because it's, you know, it, it doesn't. Uh, it, it, it's really hard to translate. And so, what we found to get around that, and, and this is without having to change a FAR or change acquisition system. This is stuff that you can do today. Um, what we found to get around that is what we've done is to hold hackathons where we bring in you know, a program manager or a government office that's looking at a specific technology, something that they want to buy or purchase in the next year. And we bring in the users of that technology. Um, anybody that's worked in acquisitions knows that uh, how far away a lot of times the acquisitions people that are buying the technology are from the users. So we like to bring in users. Um, we like to bring the subject matter experts from academia, uh, from uh, you know entrepreneurs in the ecosystem in the valley uh, that are working on a technology, that technology. Uh, venture capitalists, uh, it's amazing the research that venture capitalists have on the technologies they're investing in. Um, and so we bring all those people in a room together and start tearing apart not the technology solution, but in terms of you know what are the use cases behind that technology, and you know how is it? What are the gaps that exist today from a user perspective? And we've found that that just that process alone uh, is a much better market research tool and really helps to inform uh, the buying patterns for uh, these program management offices. <clears throat> and. Another thing that I like to advocate for, and it sounds kind of silly, but uh, one of the things I like to, to say to, to people in, inside a program office is, you know, before you start engaging with private companies and saying, you know, yes, I like your technology, and yes, I want to buy it, is, is find out, who, you know, get your tight teams together. Uh, figure out who your contracts person is, you know, somebody who understands how to work with commercial companies. Um, because there are contracts out there um, that are commercially friendly. You saw Sophia Kim's presentation today uh, about the NSTXL OTA. That, that's certainly an option. Um, there's other methods of reaching out across outside your office to contracts that have existing scope. Uh, there's, you know, FAR Part 12. I mean, there's, there's, there's ways today that can, you know, to find contract vehicles that are commercially friendly. So, so start doing that research first. You know, find your contracts person, find the finance people that have to send the money, you know, get it socialized within your office and your leadership involved if you need to. But really kind of, you know, neck down those teams to where you kind of, in a sense, it's silly to say, but get this, you know, acquisition special forces unit together, you know, within your organization so that when it's time to execute, 
you know, you don't have to go back and spend 18 months trying to get, you know, a, a plan approved. Because one of the things that we've noticed is that the, where the relationship breaks down a lot is that uh, a government office will reach out or a program manager will reach out and take a lot of meetings with a private company and that private company may or may not be mature enough to where they just don't have the resources to spend taking all these meetings and flying across the country and, and you know, responding to requests, right? And then, you know, they think that they have interest from the government, but then the, the person who is the program manager then has to go back and, and do all the steps I just described. So what, you know, we advocate for is, is do, a lot, do, do the steps beforehand. Figure out, you know, your problem translation, do your market research, uh, you know, and it, also, you know, if you want to do an RFI, but, but get, get the other steps first done and then figure out who within your organization you can use to execute. And again, um, that can all be done today without having to change a FAR. And then my last point on that is that uh, for outreach into the Silicon Valley, there, there are points of presence. There's certainly community out there of people that have been working this. Um, everybody, I think, in this room is aware of, of OSD's um, Defense Innovation Unit X, JUX. And that's a group of folks, you know, it's, it's brand new, it's been out there for two months, but um, I know the people in that organization all understand the Valley ecosystem really well and can help to direct uh, and save time for people that are coming into the Valley uh, instead of just sending them to Facebook and Google and, and Uber, right, to really uh, help, uh, help them, you know, it's a warm point of presence there to save people time they are coming to the Valley to, to find some of the companies that you may not be aware of had you just showed up in town and wanted to go see Google. Uh, and it also minimizes the Silicon Valley tourism uh, that I think some of the folks in the Valley have been complaining about where, um, you know, the, some, a general will come up, you know, come out to the Silicon Valley and then they'll visit, you know, Google and Facebook and then they'll leave and then that's it. And then people from the Valley will say, well, you know, the DOD is not doing anything. They're just coming, you know, to take tours. And so we want to help to, um, we want to help overcome that, that perception. <clears throat> So technologies that have uh, commercial use and can also be uh, used to solve a government problem can use that relationship to speed up development uh, for their product. And <clears throat> so if you think about a company's life cycle where it starts from, you know, for a technology's life cycle where it starts from an idea and, you know, eventually gets all the way up into a big company or where it gets acquired. Well, when it starts out from an, an idea, it can use that uh, venture capital money, right, to help go from concept to prototype. And then at that point, when you have a, a, a working prototype, uh, at this point, the government can provide some R&D money to then uh, bring that prototype in for testing and get some early influence on that tool in terms of how it's used in the government. And this is beneficial to both sides for, for, for two reasons. One, from the private sector side, it really helps to uh, understand some more use cases for their um, technology that they hadn't thought about before. And it's also attractive to their investors when they have to go back and raise more money. Um, from the government side, uh, it's attractive in the sense that you get earlier influence and access to an emerging technology that you may not have had until later in the cycle when it's more difficult to integrate into a program. Um, as that prototype evolves, right, and that company can go back now and go get more series or more money, say potentially go through a venture capital series A um, and help attract more money to that. Uh, the government in essence is saving money if they want to continue using that tool. So the example of that is, is say, for instance, you take a cyber tool that's being developed, right? And I've seen, I'm using this example from, from uh, experience, where the government, say, will provide $1 million during that prototype phase. Um, and then they're able to go out and attract, say, $10 million in uh, venture capital money. 
but the government still maintains access to that tool. So if you think about it, right, the government now gets an $11 million tool for a $1 million investment. The other nice thing about working that relationship is that uh, in, this, in the overall long-term costs for sustainment, if you, if you look at um, sustainment costs in the government, that's typically a really high bill. Um, <clears throat> if you can b offload some of that burden to the commercial sector where, you know, the commercial sector, if, if, they're, if that tool or that company continues to grow, they're going to be responsible for, for sustaining and maintaining that, that technology. So now the government still has access to this tool, you know, if it desires so, yet the burden of sustainment, a lot of that sustainment is still pushed back off on the commercial sector. So over time, you, you get more rapid development uh, and the DOD is saving money. So these are lessons uh, learned um, from what we've been doing for the past two years and from what other folks in the Valley are doing. And I don't think it requires uh, today a major overhaul of the acquisition system, although I do think reform is needed uh, to, to make it more commercially attractive. Um, but certainly the commercial vehicles that are out there today, they do allow you know, private companies to keep their IP which is one of the big concerns that private companies have. And so more emphasis on, on commercially friendly practices, I think, is, is certainly uh, needed. Uh, but they do exist today, and it doesn't require a massive overhaul. So this concludes my talk. Uh, I open up for questions now. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think when you start from the innovation uh, perspective, you know, you're starting down at the R&D level, and so you want to have a handle on that emerging tech in terms of what's coming out there. So if you take cybersecurity, for example, um, that's a problem, I think, that affects both strategic and tactical uh, concerns, and so, uh, it can only, I think, benefit us from a strategic and tactical perspective if we're able to have the latest, I think, cybersecurity tools that are out there uh, to protect us as we're, you know, out in the world. I mean, that's just one example. But I, I think, you know, it certainly starts from, from down at the R&D level in terms of, um, you know, we have to start it there. And then, you know, as we move along in this relationship, I think you'll see more of these technologies getting into programs and records and larger programs where it, it's, it's more at the strategic level. Does that answer your question? Well, I mean, I, was, I guess I was saying that the value of Silicon Valley is not just about technology. Yeah. It's about new ways of thinking and innovative mindsets. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's just a natural um, evolution as we become, you know, as we get better relationships in the Valley. Um, I'm hoping that through that, we'll get, you know, th there's some osmosis there that happens in terms of bringing some of those culture, cultural uh, differences back into the DOD. I, you know, I think on the one hand, you know, I, I hear it a lot where you say, how can we change a DOD to make it more innovative? And I don't think it makes sense to turn the DOD into the private sector, or to make the DOD and say, we need to try to be like Google. We, we have a different culture, and, um, and I think we need to maintain that culture, right? We, we send people off to war. And, um, but, but I do think allowing, uh, you know, if you look at the rapid equipping force example, you know, that, that one of our partners, Peter, Peter Knoll, um, was the director of there, like they, they were empowering soldiers in the field to get feedback, uh, you know, back to the engineers and the teams and acquisition teams. And so I think putting more emphasis on some of that rapid prototyping 
and, and feedback already is opening up the culture more than, than it has in the past. So I think more of that's going to continue. And that can only help as we're working with the Silicon Valley and seeing their processes. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Kristen Wheeler on um, Navy. And uh, I guess one of the big questions that I keep having, uh, trying to reconcile in my head with the Silicon Valley is, um, have you had any challenges and then wins or gains or solutions for contracting ethics? Um, so, you know, like um, sole source bidding or, you know, like if somebody has this technology, like how do other people also get to bid on that? Or, uh, you know, that, that seems to be a, a... So are you saying, do we have challenges with... Uh, getting sole source contracts well, or? Uh, so if you, I mean, what I'm used to is here's the requirements, you know, then and then you go out and the ones that see it most are the people that have obviously been working with the military, Lockheed, Boeing, all those people. And then they go and they bid on, oh yeah, we can build this. Mm -hmm. And then it goes through the five to seven year acquisition at minimum, you know, process. But with these uh, new technologies that are coming out from forward thinking, uh, tech companies in Silicon Valley, uh, how, how do you overcome, I guess, the challenges of um, ethics, uh, not being perceived as uh, showing favoritism towards one company or getting a contract from them, and then also uh, the timeline of five to seven years? Yeah, I, I, so when you look at the five to seven year Timeline that typically is more for a program of record for the really large programs, and I and I don't think you know if, if you're for today I I don't think that's where the Silicon Valley is you know going to play in I mean th that's going to main continue to be with the traditional primes, but I, for now but I think if you're looking at um, smaller one year efforts you know rapid prototyping R and D money which is what that's meant for. Um, then I don't think there's any ethical issues there because they're just, they're just participating in an ecosystem that, that already happens within the DOD, right? There's a lot of tech being developed um, from, you know, all over the place, from labs and from different areas. And I, and I feel like, you know, Silicon Valley tech can, can play into some of those programs. Um, and, and that's where it needs to start, you know, it is really taking and looking at some of that tech and, uh, developing it to where it can later get into some of those five to seven year programs. Does that answer your question? Am I? So in your, your, your question also had to do with ethics, right? Right, you have to go through competition. Right. So when it comes to uh, Silicon Valley, I guess, so how does it translate in the military where we're in these very small spheres of it? Like, how would I, how would I a surface warfare lieutenant in the Navy, be able to reach out and find tech solutions to some of the problems that we're having on the field? Well, I mean, it goes back to, I think, the original process, right? You have to go through your, your contracting process, right? And so I, but I do think, um, Again, doing that market research beforehand and then f going and talking within your group to see what's possible, um, that, that's, that's the normal, you know, finding your contracts officer and then uh, finding what that pathway is. For us, for me, when I was in the military, a lot of times that was finding contract vehicles that had existing scope. And a lot of people don't know how to do that, um, you know, within the government, but that is absolutely possible. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I go into acquisition speak, so somebody who, you know, is an operator may not understand that process, but um, that is available. Um, if you talk to a contracts person, if you talk to an acquisitions person, right, it's finding out, you know, what contract vehicles are available outside of your organization um, that you can use that have existing scope and that you can send money to. But that's sort of the second step. First, I think the first step is finding, is doing your market research and, and then, and making sure that really is a company that you want to do business with, and then going down the steps. That, none of that 
poses ethical problems. Time for one more. Oh gosh, okay. Sorry. I, I know George had a question. And, and I, if you want it, hold on for the yeah. mic, please, since we've got people mic'd up. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, great work that Pete did with the REF, and that was a you know a pathfinder for trying to get things developed quickly and fielded quickly. So if we already kind of know what the uh, what the secret is to getting things out there quickly, why isn't this mainstreamed across all DoD, and we just have these little pockets of or little organizations that try to do it quickly? I have no, I have no idea. <laughs> I've been asking that question too. I mean, if you look at the rapid equipping force example. Um, I think that's a great model. You know, when Pete was the director there, he executed $1.2 billion on a $200 million, $200 million budget. And so what that means is that he was reaching out outside of his office, right, finding mission partners that were able to put money into the, um, uh, joint projects um, and develop things together to benefit the user. And I think that model should be repeated across the DoD. So many offices have stovepipes and they have no idea what happens outside of their office, right? If you can work outside of your office to find mission partners, to coalesce money around a technology uh, that's going to help a user and you can find you know, a, a common platform for that, I feel like that's, that's, that's the model and I, I agree with that. I don't, I don't know why that doesn't happen more. I think that's a level above my, high, you know, my pay grade. Um, maybe DIUX can help to solve that. <laughs> but, you know, there, there's certainly places in, in the DOD that do this. You know, the, the REF, um, Colonel Cayley's organization, E2O, you know, does a lot of rapid prototyping work. Um, you know, I've come across other uh, pockets. Um, so I think, you know, they're certainly out there. It's just educating, I think, at the, hi at the higher level as to how to make it more institutionalized. 